Welcome to COVID-19, What Pharmacists Know Now. My name is Rami Magoin, and I am currently the Clinical Coordinator and a Clinical Pharmacy Specialist in Critical Care at Surrey Memorial Hospital. Today, I will be reviewing the recently published preliminary results of dexamethasone in hospitalized patients with COVID-19 by the Recovery Collaborative Group. This presentation is brought to you by the Canadian Society of Hospital Pharmacists, British Columbia branch. I have no current or past relationships with commercial entities. This learning activity has received no financial or in-kind support from any commercial or other organization. The views in this presentation are my own and do not reflect those of CSHP BC branch. And as you know, the COVID-19 pandemic is still evolving, as is the evidence. The information presented is current as of August 28, 2020. By the end of this presentation, you will be able to evaluate the recently published clinical data on dexamethasone in hospitalized patients with COVID-19 by the Recovery Collaborative Group, review clinical practice guideline recommendation updates, and recommend an evidence-based strategy employing the use of corticosteroids in COVID-19 patients. Preliminary results of the dexamethasone in hospitalized patients with COVID-19 study were first published in the New England Journal of Medicine on July 17, 2020. The study was designed as an ongoing, open-label, multi-centered, randomized, adaptive platform trial with multiple active treatment arms conducted across the United Kingdom. With an adaptive platform trial, treatment arms can be added or removed based on emerging evidence while maintaining the pre-specified randomization ratio between intervention groups. Patients who were greater than or equal to 18 years of age, admitted to hospital for laboratory confirmed COVID-19, and had no medical conditions that might put the patient at significant risk from the trial, were eligible. These medical conditions were in the opinion of the treating clinician and no specific medical conditions were explicitly described for exclusion criteria. Inclusion criteria was further expanded on April 9, 2020 to include patients with suspected COVID-19 and later to include patients that were pregnant and breastfeeding and patients younger than 18 years of age. Eligible and consenting patients were assigned in a two to one ratio to receive either dexamethasone six milligrams oral or intravenous once daily for up to 10 days or until hospital discharge, plus the usual standard of care or the usual standard of care alone. The primary outcome was all cause mortality within 28 days after randomization. Secondary outcomes were the time until discharge from the hospital and among patients not receiving invasive mechanical ventilation at the time of randomization, subsequent receipt of invasive mechanical ventilation or death, cause specific mortality, receipt of renal dialysis, and the duration of the invasive mechanical ventilation. Outcome data were collected via an online follow-up form that was completed once at the time of hospital discharge, death, or 28 days post-randomization, whichever came first. 11,303 patients were recruited for the recovery trial, and approximately 17% of those were excluded because dexamethasone was not available or patients were not considered suitable for randomization to dexamethasone. 9,355 patients underwent randomization between dexamethasone and other treatments. A total of 6,425 patients underwent randomization between dexamethasone and usual care alone. 2,104 patients were assigned to receive dexamethasone, while 4,321 patients were assigned to receive usual care alone. Note, 8% of patients received dexamethasone as a part of their usual care in the usual care alone group. The subgroup of patients who later underwent a second randomization to tosluzumab versus usual care in the recovery trial included 95 patients in the dexamethasone group and 276 patients in the usual care group. 
In addition, 13 patients were randomly assigned to receive either convalescent plasma or usual care alone. Baseline characteristics with respect to age, sex, median number of days since symptom onset, and median number of days since hospitalization were similar between groups. Important to note that six pregnant women were included within the females. The investigators deemed a mean age difference of 1.1 years of age between the two groups as a clinically relevant difference, despite randomization. Therefore, the investigators age adjusted all study outcomes. As you can see, the dexamethasone group appears to have more patients greater than 70 years of age, favoring the usual care group. No quantitative clinical parameters or laboratory data were reported. From the total number of patients randomized to either intervention group at randomization, 24% were receiving no oxygen, 60% were receiving oxygen only, and 16% were receiving invasive mechanical ventilation. It is important to note that invasive mechanical ventilation included ECMO patients, and oxygen-only therapy included non-invasive ventilation, including continuous positive airway pressure and high-flow nasal oxygen. Interestingly enough, younger patients received ventilation while older patients received no oxygen. As you can see, the patients on average were 10 years younger in the invasive mechanical ventilation group compared to the no oxygen group. This makes you wonder if sites had to ration ventilators with the surge of patients, or is there an unknown epidemiological difference? Median number of days since symptom onset and median number of days since hospitalization were longer as expected in the invasive mechanical ventilation group of patients. Among the two intervention groups, there were more chronic lung disease in the usual care group, perhaps favoring the dexamethasone group, and more patients had negative SARS-CoV-2 tests in the dexamethasone group, and the impact of this imbalance on outcomes is really unknown. When reviewing respiratory support received at randomization, it is apparent that more patients had heart disease and chronic lung disease in the no oxygen group compared to the invasive mechanical ventilation group. This makes you again wonder if sites had to ration ventilators with the surge of patients, or is there an unknown epidemiological difference? As expected, we see a higher number of patients with severe kidney impairment in the mechanically ventilated patients. Among patients allocated dexamethasone, it was taken for a median of seven days. Of those with a completed follow-up form, other treatment allocation was similar among the two groups. Again, it is important to note that after remdesivir became available in the United Kingdom on May 26, 2020, the drug was administered to three patients in the dexamethasone group and two patients in the usual care group, which is not reflected in this supplementary table. There are also some inconsistencies in reporting regarding the number of patients that received tocilizumab in the published paper and supplementary material, which I hope the investigators will address in the final publication. Here, the investigators report the rate ratio for the outcomes of 28-day mortality and hospital discharge, and risk ratio for the outcome of receipt of invasive mechanical ventilation or death and its subcomponents among patients not receiving invasive mechanical ventilation at the time of randomization. Estimates of the rate and risk ratios and its 95% confidence interval have been adjusted for age in three categories, less than 70 years of age, between 70 to 79 years of age, and 80 years or older. There is a statistically significant difference in the mortality at 28 days with a rate ratio of 0.83 with a 95% confidence interval not crossing one, giving you a number needed to treat of approximately 35. The results were similar in a post hoc exploratory analysis restricted to the 89% of patients with the positive SARS-CoV-2 test result. Likewise, sensitivity analyses without adjustment for age resulted in similar findings as well. There was no difference in the rate of discharge from hospital within 28 days between the two groups. Among patients not receiving invasive mechanical ventilation at the time of randomization, there was no difference between the two groups in the subsequent receipt of invasive mechanical ventilation or death as a composite. Analyses are ongoing regarding other secondary outcomes such as cause-specific mortality, 
the need for renal dialysis or hemofiltration, and the duration of ventilation. Now let's look at the effect of dexamethasone on 28-day mortality according to respiratory support at randomization. Shown here are subgroup specific rate ratios for all patients and for those who were receiving no oxygen, receiving oxygen only, or undergoing invasive mechanical ventilation at the time of randomization. As you can see, the invasive mechanical ventilation and oxygen only group favor dexamethasone over usual care, with the number needed to treat of eight for invasive mechanical ventilation group and the number needed to treat of 34 for the oxygen only group. The next two slides show Kaplan-Meier survival curves for 28-day mortality among all the patients in the trial and in the three respiratory support subgroups according to whether the patients were receiving no supplemental oxygen, receiving oxygen only without mechanical ventilation, or undergoing invasive mechanical ventilation at the time of randomization. It is important to note that Kaplan-Meier curves have not been adjusted for age. The rate ratios have been adjusted for the age of the patients in the three categories of less than 70 years of age, between 70 to 79 years of age, and greater than 80 years of age. As you can see, the benefit is seen early within seven days of randomization when looking at all patients on the left-hand side. However, this benefit and the mortality benefit is not translated to the no oxygen group on the right. This may be due to the fact that the patients were older and had more comorbidities such as heart disease and chronic lung disease in the no oxygen group. When we look at the invasive mechanical ventilation group on the left-hand side, the mortality benefit is seen early within seven days since randomization. And the two groups further diverge as days since randomization increase. On the right-hand side for the oxygen only group, which included non-invasive ventilation such as continuous positive airway pressure and high flow nasal oxygen also shows mortality benefit over the days since randomization. It is important to note that within this oxygen only group, there could be a wide range of severity of respiratory distress. For example, they may have included a 35 year old woman requiring two liters per minute nasal cannula or a 65 year old woman with type 2 diabetes requiring 6 liters per minute of nasal cannula, or a 55-year-old obese man with type 2 diabetes, coronary artery disease requiring high flow nasal cannula at 55 liters per minute on 100% FiO2. So it is unclear who truly benefits from dexamethasone within this oxygen-only group. Although this trial was well conducted, there are a few limitations. Firstly, with an open label design, treating clinicians are not blinded to treatment, thereby introducing possible bias. In an adaptive platform design, it becomes difficult to control for a type 1 error as randomization arms may be added, removed, or paused according to multiple interim, unblinded analyses of the study data. Statistically, interim analyses not properly taken into account generate an inflation of the type 1 error rate, which may be increased again by the multiple treatment arms. Type 1 error rate can be limited in interim analyses, however, require the maximal sample size to be defined a priori, which was not possible at the outset of this trial, and that the timing and number of interim analyses be pre-planned. The study protocol stated that the data monitoring committee would be analyzing the data approximately every two weeks However, the exact number and time is unclear in the data published. Furthermore, approximately 17% of patients were excluded as either dexamethasone was either unavailable at the hospital at the time of enrollment or considered to be contraindicated by the treating physician. It is unclear what the exact reasons of contraindication were and this may be helpful to determine which patients were excluded when interpreting the results. Next, it is unclear if the results are generalizable to the Canadian population. As the patients in the invasive mechanical ventilation group were approximately 10 years younger than the oxygen only and no oxygen group and had less comorbidities such as heart disease and chronic lung disease. And lastly, Details of standard of care were not reported.
For example, different types of oxygen respiratory support in the oxygen-only group, the use of neuromuscular blockers, or prone positioning. These all may be helpful again to determine which patients specifically benefit from dexamethasone. Based on the preliminary trial results of the dexamethasone in hospitalized patients with COVID-19 study, the British Columbia COVID-19 Therapeutics Committee updated the clinical practice guidance for antimicrobial and immunomodulatory therapy in adult patients with COVID-19 on August 24, 2020. In critically ill COVID-19 patients who are hospitalized in intensive care units requiring mechanical ventilation and or vasopressor or inotropic support, it is strongly recommended that dexamethasone 6 mg IV or PO once daily for up to 10 days be prescribed. In severely ill COVID-19 patients hospitalized outside the intensive care unit and requiring supplemental oxygen therapy, it is recommended that dexamethasone be prescribed at 6 mg IV or PO once daily for up to 10 days. It is important to note that the Infectious Diseases Society of America and the National Institutes of Health in the U.S have both also updated their guidelines based on the results of the dexamethasone study from the Recovery Collaborative Group. We are still waiting updates from the Canadian Critical Care Society and Association of Medical Microbiology and Infectious Disease Canada and the Surviving Sepsis Campaign Guidelines. In conclusion, despite updates of treatment guidelines, there are still some unanswered questions. The first being, should dexamethasone be prescribed for all hospitalized patients? And this remains unanswered as the dexamethasone study did not provide details of the oxygen respiratory support in the oxygen only group. And therefore you wonder if patients who were on minimal support, such as two liters per minute of oxygen via nasal cannula, versus patients who were using higher support for example, high flow nasal cannula on 55 liters per minute requiring 100% FiO2 would achieve similar benefits with respect to 28 day mortality. Next is the question whether use of other corticosteroids such as prednisone, methylprednisolone or hydrocortisone for the treatment of COVID-19 provides the same benefit as dexamethasone. We know dexamethasone has minimal mineral corticoid activity, thus avoiding potential problems with fluid retention, which are common in severe viral pneumonitis, or ARDS. However, it may not have the same benefits or effects as hydrocortisone in septic shock. And this may be further supported by the recent publication of the MET-COVID trial, which was a double-blinded randomized controlled trial from Brazil which randomized approximately 400 patients to methylprednisolone versus placebo, and they did not find a reduction in 28-day mortality. Thank you so much for listening and stay safe. I have provided my contact information if you have any further questions.